Hello and welcome to the Morley College Penny Lecture on the Venice Carnival Artisan's Paradise. I'm Daniel Kinnev and this is Linda Kinnev and we're uh, going to take you through um, what it is like going to Venice Carnival, um, an annual fantastic festival and we look forward to sharing our experiences of over 20 years with you doing this fantastic festival ourselves. So, almost a thousand miles away slumbers a city waiting to awaken into a dream. And that, of course, is Venice. Every year, Carnival and millions of people come to the city to celebrate um, the days before Lent, leading up to uh, Shrove Tuesday, or Pancake Day, as you know it, and um, uh, which is the main uh, part of the celebration. Also known, of course, as Mardi Gras in different languages and around the world, the carnival traditions are very different. In Venice, it's all about historical costume, and that's where we come in. So, talking about a short history of the Venetian carnival. Um, so, in the 18th century, what was happening at, at carnival? Um, we had um, uh, about, uh, at that point, Venice had lost much of its importance as a world power, and this, this party got a bit out of control. It actually raged for about six months of the year um, when people were all in costume. And um, then uh, once Napoleon took over that region of Italy, he put a sad end to all that debauchery that was going on. So what happened then, luckily in the 1970s, there was a bit of a resurgence. So the first time I'd ever heard of Venice Carnival, actually, I was going through an airport um, and I saw a magazine in a shop where the cover story was Venice Carnival. And it was a picture of a woman in full costume standing in a, a gondola going across the Grand Canal. It was, it was absolutely magical. And I, and I thought that was something I absolutely had to try. Um, and Daniel and I met actually at Parsons School of Design in New York. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that um, that drew us together, as it were, was an interest in, in historical costuming. So we went to our first carnival in, in 2001. And in full historical costume at that time, we were doing much more reenactment type of work. Um, but one of the most magical things about Venice is that it is really a place you can be lost in time. Uh, there's no cars. Um, all the buildings are historic, all the settings are historic, all the buildings have such a rich history, um, the Cafe Florian, the amazing palazzos, and so wandering the city in full, in full costume, you really do feel like you've been transported into another time, and that has been the appeal for us ever since. Do you want to just briefly talk a bit about some of the more historic stuff on the, on the uh, mannequin next to you? Sure. Yeah. Um, so this gown um, is, is an, a historical a reproduction in some ways, uh, the pattern, the construction, the trimmings are all the kind of thing you would see in, in an original gown of this type um, and from this time. The panniers, which are the buckets people wear on the side, um, very classic 18th century. And you often hear people in museums looking at gowns like this. And the first question they ask, how do they fit through doors? Um, and the second question, how do they sit down? Um, so <laughs> the answers that I always tell uh, it, to those questions is, First of all, if you're in court and in the presence of the king, you don't sit down. So sitting down isn't necessarily an issue. Practicality isn't something that they necessarily thought about. And this is sort of what Daniel was saying about the um, the social aspects of historical costume. They had much different um, viewpoints than we do today. So uh, one of the things that they thought about in the 18th century was displaying wealth. So in modern times, we would wear designer clothes. But in the 18th century, it was about wearing as much fabric as you could possibly hang on your body um, because of the expense. It was incredibly expensive to buy particularly pure silk. So you see these gowns use lots and lots of trimming, lots and lots of fabric, because that is how they showed their wealth. So the trimming um, is all original 18th century technique, prevents fraying. Um, you might have heard, if you know about sewing, about pinking shears, so those kind of zigzag scissors uh, that people cut fabric with in modern times to prevent fraying. In these days, they had to stamp it with a special tool to prevent the fraying. And then also, all this trimming hides the various uh, openings and fastenings on this particular garment. Uh, so the other question is, how do you fit through doors? Well... Most of you are probably familiar with the concept of French doors. So door frames are much wider in that time. 
Um, and that allowed for you to walk through uh, with relative ease, although it's not necessarily as easy to get through the crowd in the Cafe Florian during full fan days today. <laughs> or in and out of a gondola. So through the labyrinths of this fantastic city where you can get lost at any turn and discover something new at any turn, during Carnival it is filled with people in historic costume. And there are kind of distinct tribes, as it were, of uh, costume goers. There are different levels of being incognito or being recognizable, actually. So there's the fully incognito kind of Venetian carnival goer that is completely covered from head to toe in cloth or mask. And you would not know if it's a woman, a man, or who this person is if you didn't actually know them personally and knew what their costume is. A lot of our friends enjoy that part of the carnival and they uh, get up very early in the morning. They do, uh, what, 4 a.m. I think yes, it is? Yes, yes. Yeah, sorry, we're still in bed at that time. But um, yeah, uh, they go out till about uh, 10 and then they change into a more cognito um, uh, kind of version where they wear a mask, okay? It's a historic costume and then just a mask, but you can more likely be able to uh, recognize them. And then, of course, there is those that just wear a historic costume as if they were living in the moment. And that really um, is more where we have ended up throughout our journey. We started off wearing masks, as one knows about Venice, and we are now um, part of the group that really kind of lives um, in a kind of alternate historic universe uh, where it's almost like the time period, but always slightly different. Um, there's a huge uh, uh, amount of uh, different people going there, and I, I, I love that about uh, Carnival. Basically, if you're into historic costume and if you're into dressing up, you're welcome. It's, it's, it's a fantastically diverse group of people from all nations, LGBT+, plus, you know, people that are straight um, and uh, cross-dressing, and a fantastic array of people um, that, you know, you get to meet, and they're all very interesting. Um, and fantastic artisans. You meet people yes. from all kinds of different backgrounds, uh, people who are professional corset makers, people who are professional costumers, people who are reenactors. They travel mm -hmm. the world uh, reenacting different battles yep. and different moments in history. Um, and then there's the people that come just for the first time and they just get very excited and they grab a costume and they go out in the square. And that's really one of the things that's, that's so wonderful about it is really, as Daniel said, everyone is welcome and anyone can take part. You don't need to have a big expensive costume. No. You don't need to have tickets to an event. You don't need to do um, know the right people. You can actually just turn up in a costume and walk the streets and actually be a part of the moment. Yeah, it's really grassroots in that way because, I mean, though the city of Venice puts on some events, they have a stage and uh, there's the Flight of the Angel and uh, the Marias are crowned, um, uh, you know, and there are parades um, and costume competitions on the main square that is called San Marco, right by the beautiful church, the Basilica of San Marco and the Campanile, the tower, and the Orologico, the uh, lovely big clock that they have there. But without people actually coming there, without people sewing themselves and uh, trying to, you know, get through these meters and meters and meters of fabric for the very first time, taking months and the whole year actually to create these kinds of garments, this really would not actually be a possibility. And that's the beauty of it because it's made by the people. It's a spectacle that is really made by the people for the people. Um, you know, so, um, yeah, so you, like uh, Linda said, we have the professionals, we have the artisans, um, and then, but there are, of course, also costume houses. Um, in the, so in San Marco, the kind of um, uh, most expensive district, you have streets lined with costume shops. Um, uh, some of them are, uh, you know, the, the Atelier Anton Antonio Sauter, um, and uh, then in, uh, you also have uh, the costume shop called Flavia. Over in uh, San Paolo, where it's a bit quieter, uh, you have uh, places like the world-famous Pietro Longhi that does a lot of um, films, right? Don't they? Uh, they do a lot of historic. What are the other ones? Uh... Well, the Bola del Doge oh, yes. is, is kind of one of the most famous um, balls. And that takes place in um, Palazzo Pisani Moretta. So mm -hmm. we'll talk a little bit about the different palazzos um, in a few minutes. And that one, they, they do films. If you're interested, you can find it online. They do all these very yeah. elaborate yeah. films and they hire lots of entertainers to come in. We went one year, many years ago, and mm -hmm. they had someone dressed 
sort of as the Tin Man walking around playing a tune on wa- glasses with water in them. It's really quite a feat of engineering to be able to yes. walk and play at the same yes. time. Yes. So they find all these kind of amazing, speaking of artisans, these are yeah. quirky entertainers. Uh, people who stroll around and draw your portrait, mm-hmm. all kinds of things. People who breathe fire. Uh, I know, I was really just going to say that. Yep. Venice is known throughout the world for its fabulous masks. There are many, many shops in the city that sell them, but there are also many smaller artisans that produce them. Here you can see the Bauta, a traditional carnival mask that not just disguises your face, but also your voice. And then there's the Moretta, a mask traditionally worn by women. You can see that it has no opening for the mouth because it's actually held in place by a button clamped in the wearer's teeth. So talking of some of the artisans, one of our favorites is a place called La Pietra Filosofale in San Marco, a small independent shop where the maker makes in the shop itself. There is, there is a, a shop in Venice where they still make custom shoes, mm-hmm. um, and you'll know it when you see it if you happen by, because it has all of these absolutely stunning uh, historical types of shoes, early 20th century and then all the way back, and you can still go in there. Um, and order shoes custom made, which is a very rare thing these days. Yeah, no, that's true. Um, it's uh, just off the uh, Salisada San Leo, right by uh, where the um, uh, Rialto Bridge is. Uh, so uh, it's a fantastic uh, artisan uh, shop once again. And um, I think there's another one somewhere. Um, and then, of course, you could get historical shoes at uh, some of the costume shops, um, especially uh, places like La Bauta in San Paolo. They have a good selection that is not too dear. Uh, yeah, the art of weed making. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, and that is a tradition. There are still places that make um, historical wigs, particularly places like Colonial Williamsburg um, mm-hmm. in America, in Virginia, where they still practice the traditional technique of making wigs out of horse uh, tail or yak hair, um, actually. It's nice and, and stiff and brittle, and it holds the shape um, particularly well. We have some custom-made wigs uh, that we bought for our very first carnival. Yes. And 20 years later, we are still wearing them. So that was money well spent. Uh, nowadays, our daughter, who has been brought up in in uh, the parties of carnival, does our wig styling for us, and she that's her contribution to the to the family costume um, trade, as it were. Uh, you can also buy. Uh, there are some very reasonably priced historical yeah. wigs yeah. that you can get even in fancy dress shops. Uh, I I like to buy historical wigs and then spray paint them a color, uh, particularly to go with with one of our outfits. So uh, years ago, we went to an Alice in Wonderland themed ball yeah. um, and Daniel went as uh, the caterpillar. Yeah. And so blue was the was the costume and we bought a fabulous women's 18th century wig in white and spray painted it blue and it was absolutely perfect for yeah, no. uh, for that particular ball. Uh, people have their own signatures really. Uh, some people always go in the 18th century, some people prefer Tudor, um, so you know you'll see people in doublets, you'll see people in pluter hose, uh, you'll see people in you know gowns like the one Linda was just talking about, so roba la française or anglaises and uh, all these fantastic things. A lot of uh, French Revolution outfits uh, which is one of the high points really of, of fashion anyhow and uh, exquisitely done. Um, some of the some of the costumes that are absolutely so stunning they look like they were bought in the time period particularly yeah. Victorian Lots yes. of people do oh these absolutely gosh. stunning Victorian gowns with bustles and corsets and all the trimmings um, and the jet beating yeah. and really yeah. is something to say. Yeah well speaking of which hats <laughs> you are no one uh, if you do not have a fantastic um, <laughs> used to be to get into um, the lovely cafes, uh, you would have the, hat, the bigger the hat, the easier you were recognized in the crowd, and you got to go in. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I mean, you have, a, of course, a variety of hats yourself, obviously. I mean, there are the tricorn hats uh, from, you know, the 18th century for menswear, um, and then um, all these lovely other kind of hats or caps, as they were. Um, yeah. I think the important thing is if you were doing historical costume to make sure you have all the accessories. I think is what you're trying to say because it is a full, full look in order to really truly be uh, to be a part of that kind of historical aspect because that is how they dress. So what does a typical day at Carnival look like for us? Well, 
We get up at around 10, and it's still time to sew a bit more. Of course, because with the best will in the world, we always try to finish our garments before we leave, but we always end up bringing some sewing along with us. And for me, that's really part of the fun. Relaxing, listening to the city, and working on my costumes. How many pieces have actually been made there? I cannot count. <laughs> it's uh, really always fantastic. Of course, there's time to then get dressed and makeup and all the other underpinnings. Yeah, there's between the corsets, the bustles, the panniers, the wigs, um, and the makeup. It does take quite a bit of time, so don't underestimate how long you might need to spend getting dressed. And then, of course, it's time to go out into the city and enjoy the square, um, where, of course, the most of the action is. And then also find some secluded, lovely spots in this magical backdrop and do some of your own photos. And then, of course, it's off to our one of our favorite places in Venice, the Café Florian. Yeah, the Café Florian is uh, one of the key points in the Venetian Carnival, where you can see some of the best costumes that people have been working hard on all their, uh, the whole year long. The side rooms that you can see, you can wander through, and uh, you actually get a chance to then really be part of the fantastic spectacle that Carnival is. And of course, the most coveted seats in the Florian are by the windows, and it's um, the perfect place for people watching. So you can sit there with your cappuccino for hours on end, which we always enjoy watching, um, watching people come and go in, in all of their magnificent splendor and just being part of the living theater. Yeah, living theater is really the word. Um, I mean, you can bump into characters from the Commedia dell'arte through to Casanova and all uh, kinds of historical figures that are here. So here we are taking you on a little journey uh, to give you an idea of what it's like to get into the Florian. Uh, you can even just always go to the bar if you don't fancy uh, taking a table and um, have bar service there. And uh, then, as you can see, be completely surrounded by the most extravagant costumes that you'll probably can find um, anywhere, be it in Venice <laughs> or around the world. So that's quite a high bar. And don't forget, no matter where you're sitting, it's worth every once in a while getting up and taking a stroll around just to look in all the other rooms because you never know who you might find hiding in there. Um, yeah, so more about the palazzos that we've had the pleasure of going to. Um, one of the most beautiful ones, it's a relatively small palazzo, but its decoration is so out of this world. Uh, it's like stepping into a jewel box uh, when you when you get into the higher level, which is called the piazza, uh, the, uh, sorry, um, the piano nobile. So um, that is uh, Palazzo Zenobia, um, uh, which is uh, one of the, like I said, uh, most extraordinary palazzos, and there are often balls taking place there especially on a Saturday and a Sunday night, is it? Mm -hmm. Yes, right? Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, so in any event, uh, it has one of the uh, rare things in Venice, which is a garden. There's not a lot of green space in Venice, so it's a beautiful opportunity to be in historic co um, costume in the middle of the night, usually some uh, fantastic, you know, uh, of, of fire lit kind of scene going on with some uh, characters from the Commedia dell'arte uh, wandering around, jugglers, fire breathers, and there you are in this beautiful private garden that is attached to uh, the Palazzo Zenobio. And without further ado, the main events of the season the carnival balls. This is, of course, where the party of carnival reaches its fever pitch and where you are truly and completely transported into a different state of being. So lots of balls have a theme. So it can be something more fun and creative, like the Alice in Wonderland ball or the ghost ball that we've already mentioned. Lots of them have more Venetian themes, Casanova, or Travelers to Venice, or Venice in a particular time. Yeah, true. And then they also have um, more abstract themes, such as the pleasure of the senses. And, of course, sometimes even Valentine's Day falls during the carnival season, which, of course, then brings out a lovely amount of red hearts. So the uh, the 
calendar of events for the evening usually begins with cocktails and entertainment um, when you arrive, followed by a seated dinner in the main ballroom, usually by candlelight. And it's a really amazing opportunity to get to meet new people and hear their stories and, um, and just enjoy. And then after dinner, um, usually it's dancing. Sometimes it's dancing the minuet with a dance master. Um, sometimes it's performers that have br been brought in to entertain. And then um, everyone adjourns back downstairs to spend the rest of the evening mingling, dancing more, and um, enjoying the splendor that is Venice. Yeah, enjoying it and going to the early hours of the morning. Um, in terms of, of our personal um, approach on it, as Danny was saying, we've kind of adapted over the years, starting yeah. off in full historical dress. So, for example, the fully embroidered um, suit that is here. This is actually a reproduction of an original piece from um, the Kyoto Costume Institute in Japan. Um, and then in recent years, we've gone in a more kind of hybrid fantasy and historical um, those of you who might have might have seen our um, our side project, uh, Daniel's Instagram, the Tudor Wookie, um, would might give some indication of our recent interest in fusing um, fantasy and history. So here we have our Elizabethan Star Wars. We have quite a few of those, in fact. We also have included some information if you're interested in learning more about the Palazzos, or if you're interested in attending Carnival. Uh, there are some links and some websites you can visit for more information and help in planning your journey. Yeah, so see you there. <laughs> and do you tap us on the shoulder. Exactly. If you can recognize us, tap us on the shoulder and uh, say you saw us on a Thank you so much. Thank you. Lovely.